Amen. Good song. Good singing. If you would tonight, take your Bibles, turn to the book of Jude. Uh, Jude is a little one chapter epistle towards the end of your Bible, the second to last book in your Bible, right before the book of Revelation, the book of Jude. And then we'll look down beginning in verse number 20. The book of Jude, and then begin uh, beginning in verse number 20. It says, But ye beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and of some have compassion, making a difference. Now, Father, I do ask you once again to sanctify the time that we've got together tonight uh, for your purpose, Lord. Uh, to help us to hear uh, you speak to us, Lord, the, the voice of the words of the Lord, uh, the still small voice of the Spirit of God. And I pray, Lord, that you go to work in each and every one of our hearts, uh, Lord, molding us and making us uh, tonight in this time uh, more into what we ought to be, more like our Lord Jesus Christ. And let us uh, go our way tonight, uh, maintaining that shape and that uh, form and uh, living uh, more like our Savior did. Uh, teach us tonight, uh, Lord, place us where we need to be under conviction, instruct us, and uh, help us to be better for thee by the time we're done here this evening in, and going forward. In Jesus' name, amen. An inkling that they, they helped somebody, even, <laughs> even if they didn't do it on purpose, but somebody was moved uh, or changed or had their life impacted for good by something they did. And you can even watch that uh, heart melt. And, uh, you know, it, it's a noble thing. It's a noble thing to do to make a difference in someone's life for good. Uh, it's an even nobler thing to make a difference in someone's life for good and for God. And, of course, that's what we want to do as Christians. As a child of God, you want to impact somebody for good, but you want to impact somebody for God. And, and for us, there's, there's not really a distinction. To really impact somebody for good is to impact them for God, uh, to make a difference in their life uh, for the Lord and, and for them to have a closer walk with Him or to get saved. The desire of anybody who ministers for the Lord in any capacity is really to make a difference in somebody's life, uh, just like on that uh, plane that we talked about for good. Whether you're witnessing whether you are discipling somebody, uh, whether you're singing for the Lord, preaching for the Lord, uh, teaching the Bible, um, whether you're praying or, or doing a good deed, uh, your goal or your hope is to make a difference in somebody's life. And we have in the book of Jude and verse number 22, uh, a difference maker. And when it comes to making a difference, uh, that and that difference, uh, when it comes to making a difference, that difference maker in this verse is compassion. Look at the verse, Jude, verse 22. And of some have compassion making a difference. He tells you that there's some people that you can make a difference in if you just have compassion. Uh, most people respond to compassion. Now, I'll grant you there's some people who have uh, extreme hardness of heart who are moved by little or nothing. And there's some people that you can't reach that way. And that's why he goes into the next verse and he says, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. And we could um, expound on that tonight as well. But our focus is going to be on verse number 22. And of some have compassion, making a difference. That's where I want to focus uh, this evening. Uh, having compassion, making a difference in somebody's life. Uh, over 40 times the Bible uses the word uh, compassion. Uh, the first time it shows up is in Exodus, the second book of the Bible. And then the uh, next time or the last time it shows up is here in Jude, the second to last book uh, in the Bible. And as the Lord takes the hammer of the word of God, he gets to the end of the Bible. He, he takes the hammer of the word of God. Uh, he strikes it upon the anvil of compassion one more time. And the thing that he leaves us with as he gives us one final exhortation and thought about the subject is just this verse of some have compassion making a difference. It's the last instruction he gives us uh, using that word, to, to have compassion on some. Now, I think when you deal with people, that's where you always ought to start. You always, always ought to start with compassion. Um, sometimes we like to be the opposite. Sometimes we like to start, you know, being uh, with the fear, right, and, and hardness. But you always ought to start with compassion. If they don't respond to compassion, um, you don't even have to give up on it right away. You can continue to be compassionate. And then there may come a time where you have to be stern, and have to just be uh, rigid and, and, and maybe just, just in their face even a little bit. Uh, but you can even do that with compassion. But he says here, if some have compassion, making a difference. And you're not going to know if compassion is going to make a difference in somebody's life until you try it. 
So that's a good place to always start with compassion. Um, w- would you like to make a difference in somebody's life for good, for God? Then here is something that the Bible tells you is a difference maker, and you ought to try to implement it, and that is having compassion. Uh, what is compassion? By definition, Webster, in his uh, 1828 dictionary, uh, gives us these thoughts. Uh, a suffering with another. Uh, passion is, and, and it says it comes from uh, C-O-N, from, from the Spanish, which is, which is with, and then passion is uh, suffering, and, and the idea is it's, it's somebody's pain, feeling their pain. Sometimes folks say, I feel your pain, when they don't really feel your pain. But uh, this is really feeling the pain of somebody else. Uh, by definition, it continues, a sensation of sorrow excited by the, the distress or misfortunes of another. In other words, as you see somebody going through difficulties, you see them in distress, you see the misfortune that they face, you look upon them and you're, you're moved by that. It touches you, it reaches you, and uh, you got that sensation of sorrow that was excited by, by that. It, it, it moved it. It, it, it made it there to where it was in your heart and in your soul. It is compassion is pity. Compassion is a mixed passion compounded of love and sorrow. At least some portion of love generally attends the pain or regret uh, or is excited by it. And the idea of that is you look at somebody, you see somebody, you hear somebody, you're, you, there's somebody there, and, and you are touched with what they're going through. And while you're touched with what you're going through, that touch, it's, it kind of stirs a, a, a passion, not, not only feeling their suffering, but a, a concern for them a love for them, and, and, and a general idea of wanting to help that person. The first time I ever remember in my life having compassion on someone, I, I wasn't even saved. I was in grade school. Uh, we were, I was at least in fifth grade because of the side of the building we were on. And in that uh, grade school, first through fourth was on one side, and then fifth through eighth was on another side. So I was at least in fifth grade because we were on the other side of the building. It was between classes. We were heading from one class to another, and we're going from upstairs to downstairs. So we must have been going to um, a science class. And as we were heading downstairs, you know, it was just a, a mass of um, grade schoolers uh, in our class, heading from our, our one class to the other. But as we're heading down there, there was a group of girls that were walking uh, together. And um, I remember uh, one, of, one of them, uh, her name was Lisa. We had come to call her Elsie. In, in our hurtful sort of way of looking at things, we, we called her that after Elsie the Borden cow. I don't remember if we ever called it to her to her face. I, I hope not. But um, but that's how we looked at it. We thought we were so clever. But as we were going down the stairs, I said something to her, and I don't know what I said. I, I don't know if I called her that name. I, I don't know what I said. But I remember as we were going down that stairs, after I said what I said, even though I can't remember what it was, I can still remember the look on her face when I said it. I mean, it suddenly changed. And I immediately knew that I'd hurt her feelings. And boy, something changed in me right then and there as well. I, uh, I, I was moved immediately with compassion when I saw that look on her face. And I shut my mouth, though I should have opened it up and apologized. Um, I shut my mouth. I, I stopped right then and there. And I think, again, I think that there, as far as I can remember, that's that I had felt compassion for the first time um, for somebody else. And I really didn't know what to do about it, except for to stop doing what I did to bring about the hurt that, that caused her to look that way, that made me have compassion. So at least I did that. Uh, being a born-again Christian, uh, we should seek to follow the steps of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, sets a great example when it comes to the area of compassion. He sets more than one example of compassion. There are at least 10 direct references to uh, Jesus uh, having compassion in the scriptures. Uh, Some of them are overlapping as they're mentioned both in in one gospel and then in another. But if you would be like the Lord Jesus Christ, you must also have compassion on people. To follow your Savior, we, we even sing, you know, oh, to be like thee. Precious Redeemer, if you're going to be like them, you're going to have to have some compassion. And so that's what we're kind of focusing on uh, here tonight, the need to have compassion on others. And uh, it's it's necessary to be reminded because it's really easy to get self-absorbed in this life. 
absorbed that's that's absorbed with yourself like if like um like a sponge gets absorbed absorbs water you can get absorbed you know you can be that sponge and the water you absorb is all about you <laughs> and people get that way they 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 get so self absorbed and some are so self absorbed that they never have compassion upon anybody except for themselves and uh that's a difficult way to be but that is the way a lot of folks tend to be uh, they they never feel another's pain they only feel their own they, their heart never goes out to somebody else. It only goes out to their self. They care not about anybody else's distress as they're completely consumed by their own distresses. And they cannot be moved by the misfortunes of other for there's no room in their heart for anyone but self. And that's the way it tends to be. We're, we are a very self-absorbed society. I guess human nature has been this way by and large, you know, since... Since uh, Cain killed Abel, if not before that, um, you know, with Adam and Eve. But, uh, but folks tend to be just completely focused on self to the point where they can't focus on others. It's kind of strange because, you know, as you look at the physical makeup of the body, God made our eyes so that they look outward to others, not inward to self. And yet, you know, people, a lot of them spend more time looking at themselves in the mirror and they do on, at others trying to have compassion. People that are like this, that are so self-absorbed that they can't have compassion on anybody else, these people are to be pitied. <laughs> and really, I mean, you might find it hard to have compassion on them, but they need it. They are, they are to be pitied. They are emotionally and spiritually immature. Uh, I don't care how old they are physically. If you can't have compassion upon anybody else because you're so absorbed with self, you're, you're immature. Kids, babies, by nature, you know, they know nothing but self, and, and, and that's, that's normal for a baby. But as you grow, you become aware that you're not the only person in the world. And there's other people that need, uh, they, they need something just like you need something. And you can be a blessing to others, and that's what you ought to be. So unfortunately, it's easy to get that way, uh, living in this sin-cursed uh, world, in a, in a body that still has sin-cursed flesh, right? And um, it's easy for us to become hardened to the plights of other people. But, uh, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. And the uh, Lord bids us uh, follow him in this area of having some compassion. It's easy for us to become so wrapped up in ourselves, whether it's our losses, whether it's our hurts, whether it's our distresses and problems, or even our successes and just the things that we got to do in our own lives. It's, it's easy to get so wrapped up in those we don't think much about other people at all. So let me say to you, if you have become hardened in any respect to the point where you find it difficult to have compassion upon people, or if you're one of those that never has yet really had any compassion upon people, you just don't because you're so absorbed with self. I want to give you some things that you can do to help develop compassion upon others. And uh, even if you have some compassion, these things will help you to boost that compassion if you will uh, implement them. And sometimes people do these things naturally, but <laughs> if you don't do them naturally, uh, then uh, learn what they are and try to do them on purpose. So uh, let me give you uh, a number of things. First of all, in order to increase your compassion or develop compassion, number one, make a conscious, a conscious effort to think about others. Make a conscious effort to think about others. Now, come with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 10. And in Hebrews 10, we'll look at verse 24. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Not back too far from where you're at in, in the book of Jude. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 24. And here it says, And let us consider one another. What is it to consider somebody else? It's to think about somebody else. When you're considering something, you're thinking about that thing. When you're considering someone, you're thinking about that person. So he says, and let us consider one another, and to this end, to provoke unto love and to good works. Uh, that would be to make a difference in somebody's life, to provoke them to love, to provoke them to good works, to provoke them to have a heart of love and provoke them to do what they're supposed to do. So we're to, we're to consider one another. So think about that. A uh, little phrase right there, and let us consider one another at the beginning of the verse. This is what I'm talking about. Uh, make, make a conscious effort to think about other people. Consider one another. Think about somebody else. Um, doing this can help you to have compassion. Just Sometimes just stop and think about them, but you got to think about them as a person. 
Now, now here's the, here's the limit of thinking that a lot of people uh, do about people. It's um, just uh, thinking and dwelling on all uh, the negative things that they think about them. But I'm not talking about that tonight. I'm talking about going deeper and, and seeing them as a human being with a soul that, that has an eternity and also has emotions and feelings, hurts and wants. Think about other people like that. And, and really, this can work with anyone. You think about them and you think about their struggles. And everybody's got struggles. We all got problems. Everybody has difficulties. Uh, nobody has a perfect life on this earth. Uh, even if it looks outwardly sometimes like they do, everybody has problems. Everybody has issues to deal with. Uh, this is not heaven. And so, so think about uh, what those people are going through. And if you're looking at some uh, lost, wealthy individual, uh, and you're tending to just be upset with them because they're wealthy and they look like they're going to hell. Maybe you're going through what ASAP's going through in Psalm 73. We're talking about that in Sunday school right now. Um, maybe you're envious of the foolish when you see the prosperity of the wicked. Look beyond that to the fact that uh, that wicked person is on the verge of dying and going to hell and, and begin to develop some compassion. So, so think about people. Think about them. Think about their individual uh, hurts and wants and struggles. Think about their hopes and their dreams because they've got them. Think about their future. Think about their eternity. Uh, again, if they're lost, think about the fact that they're headed for hell. Think about the fact that they're going to stand before God and think of them standing before him. You know, it, uh, if you get a kick out of think about, thinking about somebody dying and standing before God, uh, you know, in, in fear and trembling and going to hell, there's something wrong with you. You want to have compassion about somebody uh, that's going to do that. And this world is filled with them. I say, how do you know it's filled with them? Because Jesus said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto light, and few there be that find it. Uh, broad is the way and wide is the gate that leadeth unto destruction, and many there be which go in there at. That means the bulk of this world is headed for hell. So there is no lack of people that you could look upon and find in any given day that you could have compassion on. And the devil keeps us absorbed with self. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things entering in and choking the word so that it becometh unfruitful, like we learn from the parable of the sower that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, taught us. You think about these people, you think about them lost, you think about them standing before a holy God, hopeless, helpless, guilty, about to be cast into the lake of fire. And if you can visualize them going through that, it might help you to have compassion on them enough to get them a witness and possibly uh, get them saved and help them avoid uh, such a fate. But you think about it. Think about them if they do die lost. After that judgment, think about them being cast into that lake of fire after the great white throne judgment. Think of their weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Uh, some years ago, uh, during the summertime uh, between semesters in uh, or between uh, years of uh, school uh, in Bible school, I was uh, at a church. This was I think between my first and second year of Bible school. I was at a, a church that summer, and it was a Saturday morning, and we we're getting ready to go out to soul winning. I was going to go out with the teens, and we we're going to go out visiting, witnessing. And I was asked to give a devotion um, for them, and so this is you know short devotion. And so on that morning, before they went out, uh, I exhorted them by reading Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. I'll read, the, I'll read it for you right now. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I read them that passage. And after reading them, I, I told them in uh, so many words, if not these exact words, but essentially, if, if that wasn't enough to motivate them, then I don't know what was. Because this is the future of every lost person. By the way, everybody, everybody's going to be there at the great white throne judgment. This is your future as well. 
you will stand there and you will uh, watch the judgment and you'll even participate in it as a, a witness. And, and you will you will be a part of that judgment and you'll observe that judgment. And anybody that you know of that's lost and you'll recognize them and see them cast in that lake of fire. They die without Jesus Christ. You'll look at them then, but you would do better to look at them now and, and be moved by their fate because that day is a coming. And then have compassion on them and do what you can to try to keep them out of that thing. If you're going to have compassion on someone, you're going to have to, you have to think about somebody else beside yourself. I mean, you stop and think about what you think about. And it's kind of like our dreams. You read in the Bible uh, sometimes about uh, some of the dreams they had and uh, one, or, one or two places or more than, I think more than one place um, uh, somebody says, and I think these might have been the guys that were um, the, the, the butler and the baker that were in the prison with Joseph. And as they were telling him his dream for Joseph interpreted it. And I think in, in one or both those cases, the guy said, I was in my dream. And I think the other one said, I was in my dream also. But, but I got to think about those words. And I mean, that's pretty much true about every dream we have, isn't it? <clears throat> think about who star, who's the star of your dreams. I was in my dream. <clears throat> I mean, I don't know if we ever have a dream where we're not involved somehow or some, some way. It's, it's what we're going through. And, and we, we tend to just by nature, it's, it's us. But I'm saying in your waking conscious moment, folks, learn to think about somebody else beside yourself. Let those eyes that God made to look outward, as I said before, let them land on somebody else and, and have compassion upon them. Ob uh, observe others. And that's the next thing I want to say. If, if you, if, and this will help you in thinking about others, if you would have compassion and, and grow that compassion, think about others. And one of the things that will help you to think about them and, and also to build that compassion is to observe others. Observe them. Uh, look at them. Watch them. The Lord Jesus Christ did this. As I said, he's, he's a great example in having compassion and uh, gives us instruction by example about how to have it. Come with me to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew 9. Matthew chapter 9. Look with me in verse 36. Matthew 9, verse 36. Let's start in 35, Matthew 9, 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. What did he do? Uh, he took a look at the multitudes. He saw them. He observed the multitudes. Uh, Jesus was a, a people watcher, and sometimes need be that. And as you do that, as you look upon them, uh, see their struggles. That's what he did. He, he saw that they uh, fainted. And you can look at people in this whole world, in this day and age, and have you not even seen a great increase of it in this last year? They're fainting out there, folks. I mean, emotionally, spiritually, they're fainting. They're, ha they're having trouble. They're in a difficult time. They're, they're wondering what in the world's going on. Uh, a lot of them facing struggles that they, they would have not uh, imagined. And, and here we are. And, and Jesus saw these people fainting. He saw them scattered abroad. He saw them as sheep having no shepherd. And <laughs> multitudes today. I mean, the shepherd they're following is the wrong one. And uh, they need the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus, John chapter 10. But uh, uh, Jesus saw these folks and was moved with compassion. Again, notice the words, verse 36. But when he saw... The multitude, he was moved with compassion. What got him moved with compassion? Watching what they're going through. Sometimes we watch what somebody else is going through. The book of Lamentations, chapter 3 and verse 51, it says, Mine eye affecteth mine heart. And it does. Mine eye affecteth mine heart. Beginning of a statement made there. What we see tends to have an effect on our heart. Now, look at the, you know who knows this? The world knows this. And they try to use it for their advantage. Um, they will put before you uh, sympathy evoking uh, videos and pictures, whether, whether or not they're staged, only they know, I suppose, and some sometimes they most certainly are, 
but they'll put before you these moving pictures and videos trying to evoke emotion out of you uh, to solicit money from you to be able to donate to the uh, organizations. And people will sit there and, and, and lap it up. It could be, it could be staged and it could be take 150, but the people are moved and they'll send in their money. Now, why not look and use your looking for good out there in the reality of life and observe people and watch them and get a move? Now, they don't, by the way, the, the world doesn't even just use this for money. They use it for causes. They'll give you part of a video or stage a, a video or a, a picture just to get you all emotionally upset about something and maybe on their side politically um, or for a particular cause. But the Lord Jesus Christ, he looked at people and he saw what they really were struggling about and he was moved with compassion upon them. And then he did something about it. And by the way, look what his conclusion was after this. After he was moved with compassion, saw him scattered abroad as a sheep having no shepherd. Verse 37, then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. What was he moved about? He was moved about their souls. Having seen uh, all these lost souls, well, he wanted somebody to reach them. Of course, Jesus would reach them himself and he would die for them. But uh, his, his eye affected his heart. Your eye affects your heart. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. And, and sometimes observe this world. Observe the lost and have compassion upon their soul. Observe the saved and, and be moved with compassion uh, to, to try to be a help and a blessing to them as well. Here in Matthew, go to chapter 14. Matthew 14. Matthew 14, verse 14. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. Once again, his eye affected his heart. He went forth and he saw. He looked at the multitude in Matthew 14. He saw the multitude in Matthew chapter 9, and he was moved with compassion in both cases. What you see others going through can help move you with compassion. In both cases, he sees a multitude in these two cases. Uh, we, like Jesus, should learn to have compassion upon the multitude. Sometimes it's good just to observe the multitude, and you'll see a multitude of different type of people in the multitude. Uh, it's, I suppose, harder to observe multitudes over this last year because they're not able to gather in multitudes as much as they were. But you're starting to see it uh, happen again. And uh, when you're out in public, you can observe, observe multitudes in, in stores sometimes. Uh, you can observe multitudes at the mall. Sometimes I remember as the Lord was getting a hold of me in my life and uh, leading up to being saved, I just, I just became a real people watcher. And I'd sit in the mall and just watch people and just observe them and, and, and try to relate to what they're going through. And ultimately, again, I got saved and, and that, you know, was then able to be used to have compassion upon their souls. But whether you're at a mall or an outdoor event or wherever the people gather in multitudes, sometimes you might want to just stop for a moment and look at them and watch them. Many running to and fro. Don't even know where they're going. I mean, you can see them up and down the streets and in the vehicles just running. There's multitudes of eagles, people going this way, that way, running to and fro. And it's like, what are they doing? Where are they going? They, they don't even know where they're going. Very many of them. I mean, when they die, they don't know where they're going. But that's where ultimately folks are going to go, heaven or hell. And uh, we who are saved and know that need to have compassion on those that don't. And sometimes just watching the multitude in their madness will help move you with compassion to try to reach them uh, with the gospel. It's easy to get cynical about the multitudes. I mean, there's a lot of crazy stuff you see in people, and, and people, you know, make themselves look crazy, I suppose, for attention a lot of times or for whatever reason they do it. And it's easy for us to get cynical. And if we're, if we're not careful, it's easy, easy for us to look at a multitude and just look down our noses at the multitude. And, and thinking, you know, we're something and they're just a bunch of fools. But uh, for some of us, it would do us good to re remember that it wasn't perhaps too awful many years ago when we were like them. And maybe even uh, behaving worse than some of the things that we're looking down our noses at them for in our own behavior. And by the way, if you're never that way, uh, you can look at them and, and just remember that if it wasn't for the grace of God, you very likely could have been that way as well. 
So as it says in Romans chapter 11, 20, be not high minded, but fear and have compassion. Uh, watch the multitude sometimes. But, but not only should we have compassion upon the multitudes, we also should have compassion upon individuals. And as you look at the multitude, start picking out individuals. Because sometimes you can't, sometimes there's nothing you can do just to reach a whole multitude, but you can reach an individual. It's like the, um, uh, the starfish story. Interesting uh, thing is, you, most of you know, um, you know, my mom passed away last year. And um, my mom had this thing about starfish, and I never really knew why. Um, she sent uh, my wife a starfish necklace, and I think um, my, my sisters each have either that or something like that. But, but mom, mom, my mom was big on starfish, and uh, they even, they even on the back of the gravestone, they, they're going to put a little starfish on there. And I've asked, you know, I knew my mom liked them, and I asked uh, my sisters, well, what, you know, what is this about the starfish? And because uh, my one sister was there working with the uh, guy about the headstone and started telling him the starfish story. So I'm picturing him telling her about why my mom was so, you know, involved in starfish. And then my sister said to me um, about the starfish story, she said, Google it. And then she sent me a link. And when I saw it, well, I saw the starfish story, but I already knew that starfish story, but I never knew that my mom knew it and it had moved her. And the starfish, so I thought it was some other thing, but the starfish story goes like this. Um, it was after a storm, as the story goes, a little boy was walking along the uh, uh, beach of the ocean and he saw a bunch of starfish that had, had washed up on the shore. And he just started going and every so often uh, he reached down, he picked up a starfish and he threw it back into the water. And he kept on doing this and um, uh, a man uh, was observing him. And finally the man uh, came up to the boy and he said, what are you doing? You'll never be able to help all those starfish and get them all back into the water. You know, sometimes people that aren't doing nothing are critical of people that are. <laughs> so you'll never be able to get all them starfish back into the water. But the little boy undaunted just kept walking. He said, you can't help them all. He just kept walking and he reached down, he picked up another one. He said, yeah, but I can help this one. And walk a little further, picked up another one. I can help this one. And maybe, you know, we, we can't win them all. You can try to warn them all, but you know what? You can pick off some. As you look at the multitude, pick out some individuals. Let the Lord knit your heart together with theirs and, and be moved uh, with compassion upon these people. I mean, sometimes as I observe an individual, it's like the Spirit of God knits their soul together with mine. I don't know them, but it's like my soul gets knit together with theirs until I feel, feel the weight of their burdens and the weight of their eternal soul like it was my very own. I'm going to tell you, that kind of compassion can make a difference as it moves you to, to do something. Sometimes I'm in a situation where I may be driving somewhere. Uh, they may be heading driving somewhere or someplace. And I, I don't, it, just, it, just, it just hits. And, and, and there's nothing I can do to talk to them. But I'll tell you what, uh, they get some prayer. They get some earnest prayer. I, uh, I want you to go to Luke chapter uh, 7. Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter number seven. Luke seven. There, look at verse 12. Now when he, that's Jesus, now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, weep not. Jesus was moved with compassion for the multitudes. He was also moved with compassion for the individual. And she, she sees this widow and he tells her, you know, it's her, it's her son. And um, uh, it was uh, the Bible says there, the only son of his mother. And Jesus sees her weeping and she, he says to her, weep not. Now, he does something that we can't do, all right? But, but this is what he did. And he came and touched the bier, and they that bear him st stood still. And he said, young man, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered uh, him to his mother. All right, so we can't do that, okay? But um, you might be able to help him get raised up at the last day, at the judgment. 
at the resurrection. They might be able to go up at the rapture if you help get them saved. There's something that, that we can do, and the Lord wants us to have compassion. He, he, he led an ex example here. Here he saw the individual. Look at chapter 10, uh, Luke 10. Here G Jesus tells the story of the uh, Good Samaritan. And we won't go through the entire story, but you know what happened. Um, some guys walked by, and they didn't have compassion. And let's look at what they did. Here's a guy half dead, left half dead, had fallen among thieves. Verse 31. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, according to what we've seen by the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, what should the next thing say? He had compassion on him. But he didn't. He didn't. He, he, had, he was absorbed in his own self and his own life. And when he saw him, he, had, he passed by on the other side. Why did he pass by on the other side? Why didn't he pass by on the same side? He wanted to get far away so he wouldn't have to deal with it. He didn't want to deal with it. He couldn't be bothered. Though he was, it says right in that verse there, a priest. Verse 32. And likewise a Levite uh, who, who also ministered uh, for the Lord. And likewise a Levite when he was at the place, came and looked on him, no compassion, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, here we go, he had compassion on him. And he did. And he took care of him. You know the story. Uh, put him on his own beast, took him to the inn, that poured oil in his wounds, had compassion. And uh, Jesus said, now, uh, uh, which of these three, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the, the thieves? Well, it was a no-brainer. Of course, I think he was talking to some people who had no brains, practically speaking, uh, spiritually speaking. And, and so the Lord um, uh, laid that on them. But here's the example. Here's somebody, a Samaritan, had compassion upon an individual. Notice it says at the end of verse 30 that they, well, let's re, just read verse 30. And Jesus answering, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. <laughs> Jericho, by the way, is a cursed city, Old Testament, Joshua, and fell among thieves. There's people out here to rob and steal your soul. Uh, the devils are, are working to that end. Which stripped him of his raiment, uh, took away that, that white, clean raiment, and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And that's kind of the case, uh, this, the situation of lost people. They're half dead. They're in a body that's alive, and spiritually they're dead. And so we're dealing with people like that all of the time, that, that, are, that are half dead. And you need to look upon them like the Samaritan did, with some compassion to be moved, and, and at least try to get them the gospel some way, somehow. I thank God that before I got saved, one of my friends uh, was moved with compassion toward me. Uh, his name was uh, uh, Chuck Tyler, and Chuck and I had gone to high school together, and uh, we had done you know high school things together. He wasn't saved, and I wasn't saved. But sometime after that, Chuck got saved, <laughs> and um, uh, Chuck uh, got into church, and he got into the Bible, and uh, I, I guess he probably prayed for me, and probably asked some other people to pray for me. And uh, one night, while I was going through my own struggles, and I was um, heading towards trying to, I was trying to find my own way to heaven at that point in my life. And I was in the Catholic Church, and I had made a decision. You know, it was it was hard to make, but I made it. If it, whatever it takes to get to heaven, I'm going to do it, and uh, I'm going to, I'll become a priest if I have to. And I was uh, working on those things, and Chuck came, and. I was still blinded thinking I was in the one true church, but he came to try to witness to me. I think he dropped off some uh, chick tracks with me that night as well. Um, but I remember kind of just blowing him off because I thought I'm in the one true church, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm finding things my way. But I'm glad that he came because as time went by and I visited uh, a seminary in Minnesota and found no answers. And I visited another seminary in Indiana and found no answers. And I talked to my priest uh, and found no answers. And I talked to a monk at one of the seminaries and found no answers. And I talked to my friends and found no answers. And I could find no answers on my own. About uh, a few days or so after I got back, maybe it was a week or so after I got back from that second visiting that second uh, seminary, um, I remembered Chuck. Because what Chuck had told me was this. He, he really didn't know enough to, to, to witness to me and lead me to the Lord. He just tried to do the best that he could. And, and it was good. 
but he told me, you, you ought to come and talk to my pastor. And after I got no answer from, from anybody else, I, I remembered that. And I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to call Chuck and, and I'm going to find out. I'm going to go see about going and talking to this pastor. Made arrangements to do so. Um, uh, long story short, the pastor was not available the first night, but he was the second. And um, I called. So I called Chuck again the second night, went out, uh, talked to his pastor after a, a teenage Bible study that they were holding, talked to his pastor. And uh, the pastor was able to give me the gospel. He could tell me what my priest could not. My priest could not. I told my priest, I said, I just want to know I'm going to heaven. How can I know I'm going to heaven? He told me, nobody really knows for sure. All right, you had your chance. And um, uh, and and, I, and when I talked to uh, Chuck's pastor, he opened up a King James Bible, and I had questions and found out the Bible had answers. And then he showed me so that I could see for the very first time in my life how that I could know that I was going to heaven. And that's what I wanted more than anything. And I, I saw that night, and I prayed that night, and asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save me. And uh, and when I was done praying, I still didn't know I was going to heaven. You know, he he asked me before we started witnessing me, if you're to die right now, are you 100% sure you go to heaven? And uh, I, I've told you before, but I looked right back at him and I said, "Are you?" He didn't know he didn't know who he was talking to. I was looking for this for months, and uh, he told me he was and. I thought to myself, like the priest had taught me, well, you know, you think you are, but nobody really knows for sure. I didn't say it out loud, but after we sat down, he showed me from the scriptures, and and, and uh, I prayed. He asked me again. He said, now, if you're to die right now, are you 100% sure you go to heaven? I, I didn't know yet. All I could say was, I, I hope. And then he started showing me verses on assurance of salvation. Um, these things, 1 John 5, 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that she may know that she have eternal life. And he got showing me those verses on assurance and explaining it to me. And I'm going to tell you, uh, I don't know exactly what point it was, but somewhere while he was talking, the light began to shine in my soul. And the Holy Spirit of witness, the Holy Spirit of God began to bear witness to my spirit that I was a child of God. And I knew I was saved for the first time in my life. And uh, that was 41 years ago. Not too, not too many uh, hours or, or, or minutes from where we're at right now, about 41 years ago at this time, I was probably sitting in the back of that little country church, 18-year-old with a bunch of uh, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15-year-old uh, kids um, at a Bible study, waiting to talk to the pastor when it was over. And it's, it, it is good to be saved. It has been good to be saved. It's always good to be saved. But I thank God for somebody, Chuck Tyler, who as, as an individual had compassion upon my soul, and that led me to be able to, to find somebody that could lead me uh, to the Lord. So you, wanna, you want your compassion to grow. You want to develop your compassion. Consider people. Think about other people. Um, observe other people. Uh, let me give you something else. Uh, listen to other people. Listen to them. Now, it's been said that God gave us two ears and one mouth. So we ought to listen, you know, twice as much as we speak. And sometimes I think for some folks, it goes about the opposite of that. And sometimes even in conversation, you can be so focused on what it is that you want to say that you're really not listening to the person. You're only listening for the person to be quiet so that you can say what you want to say. And sometimes people don't even wait for the person to be quiet. I mean, you ever observe a conversation and I mean, both of them are talking at the same time. I mean, sometimes, please don't take this wrong, lady, but sometimes we observe a group of women and three of them be talking at the same time. And I'm going to tell you what, I think that everybody catches everything there. I mean, but us, uh, but, but men, we're, we, 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 I guess we're more single focused, you know. Uh, may, may, maybe we don't multitask as well as the women do. I have been accused of not being able to do that by someone that I think loves me very much. <laughs> right, dear? <laughs> but, but sometimes we just need to focus and you need to listen to other people. Guess who was good at this also? Give you one guess. Good guess. He said Jesus. <laughs> Look at Matthew chapter 20. Matthew 20, verse number 29. Matthew 20, verse number 29. And as they departed from Jericho, a, a great multitude followed him. 
And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. The multitude heard some people that were annoying, and they thought they were annoying Jesus. And the multitude rebuked them, but Jesus listened to them and heard their words and let their saying sink down into uh, his ears. Look at verse 32. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? Why do you say that? Because he heard what they had said. He listened to him. And they said, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. Those are words that gets the, get the Savior's attention. And he said, What will ye that I should do unto you? And they said unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be open. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. And immediately they received uh, sight and they followed him. Learn to listen to other people. Sometimes your, your compassion can develop just by listening to what they say. You got to listen to them. Uh, sometimes we think we know them. We think we understand, and, and you may not. But we think we know what their issue is. Sometimes you might have to listen and let them speak in order that their uh, issue might be revealed to you, and then you can more properly uh, minister uh, to their soul. Go to Exodus chapter 2, if you will. This is the first time compassion shows up in the Bible. I mentioned this reference earlier. It's Exodus 2, verse 6. Uh, at, least, at least I mentioned that it was here in Exodus, uh, book of Exodus. It's Exodus chapter 2, verse number 6. What has happened here is um, uh, Pharaoh had ordered the death of the uh, babies of the Israelites, and the midwives in the previous chapter had saved them. And um, Amram and, and Jochebed, this couple, had a, a little baby, and um, they, they were not about to turn him over to be slain, um, and so uh, they hit him. And Remember what happened? They took him, put him in an ark of bulrushes in the water, and uh, his sister watched to see what happened. And, and here's what happened. Exodus chapter 2, um, beginning in verse number 5. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's edge. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept, and she had compassion on him. And said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. She got a double dose. She observed, had compassion on seeing that little bitty baby. And she also listened. She heard the baby weep. And it moved her with compassion on a baby of a people that were the enemy of her father, the Hebrews. I mean, he, he, he's trying to, he's oppressing them. He's, he's trying to uh, kill those little babies so they don't multiply and grow up and outnumber them. And, and she had compassion. Sometimes, again, watching and listening can help you have compassion, even on somebody that, that previously you might not have uh, thought you could ever like or care about. Uh, something else you can do uh, to have compassion is uh, pray for other people. Of course, James chapter 5, 16, uh, within that verse, it tells us pray one for another. Praying for others can help to, to bolster that compassion for them. It can help give you compassion for somebody you had previously had no compassion about just by praying for them. It is hard to hate somebody when you're praying for them. It's hard not to care about somebody when you're praying for them. You might even be mad at them. You might not even like them. But as you begin to pray for them, you know, and God gets in that thing, it's the Lord begins to rearrange your heart because you realize they need help. Prayer can melt your heart and heart and make room for compassion for the people that you are praying for. So, so think about others, um, observe others, listen to others, pray for others, pray for others. And then come to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. If nothing else will give you compassion, sometimes you can gain compassion and sympathy for others. Sometimes it can develop just through your own personal struggles. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Sometimes other folks don't have compassion. Sometimes folks don't have compassion for other people until they go through something difficult themselves or go through something that somebody else is going through. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, we read this beginning in verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them 
which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Six, and whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation. So sometimes the Lord will let you be afflicted in order that you might console somebody else. Because maybe you couldn't do it before. Or you couldn't do it well. Whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. So God sometime will let you go through something so you can have some compassion upon somebody else. You know what? Uh, if you can develop compassion without that, you might avoid having to have the Lord put you through some things that you might not want to go through. There are some things we can go through regardless, but I'm, I'm just saying it's, it's best to work on these uh, first four elements to develop your compassion as opposed to waiting for God to have to put you through something just so you can have some sympathy for somebody else. Hebrews chapter 5. Sometimes the Lord has to put us through a humbling in order for us to be humble and uh, care about somebody besides ourselves. Hebrews chapter number 5. <clears throat> As we come down the home stretch here, Hebrews chapter 5, working our way uh, towards the end. Hebrews chapter 5, a few more things to uh, cover. Uh, stay with me. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 1. <clears throat> for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant, and on them that are out of the way, for that he all, himself also is compassed with infirmity. As you recognize your own frailties as a human being, you can eat more easily have compassion upon the frailties of others. And, and God gave a, uh, the priest here, he took priests from, from people that were people. I mean, men of like passions. That's all the Lord had to choose from here on this earth. And even our Lord Jesus Christ, go to chapter uh, 4. Even our Lord Jesus Christ took on flesh that, that he might be able to have compassion upon us more so. For it says in Hebrews 4, verse 15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. That means our high priest can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Why? Because it says uh, of, of him, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. In the same flesh he faced the temptation in all points like we face it, and... Because of that, he can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And you being a human being ought to be able to be touched with the infirmities of others. Because uh, we're all people of like passions. Now, I want to revisit real quick two verses that we uh, saw earlier. Matthew chapter 9 and then Matthew 14. Matthew 9. Um, we're talking about developing compassion. But once you have that compassion, what should it do? Matthew chapter 9. And pretty much kind of, I think, understood this as we've gone through here. But let's just uh, nail it down and say it. For in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, it says of Jesus, But when he saw the multitude, he was, I want you to notice the next word, moved with compassion. Uh, this is more than just feeling compassion. This is doing something about the compassion. Chapter 14, verse 14. Same thing, Matthew 14, verse 14. Different situation. Same um, compassion and, and the same type of a thing. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. In both cases, it said he was moved with compassion. And properly, folks, compassion should not just be felt. It should be acted upon. Um, charity is like that. Charity is not just a feeling of love. It's, it's love and action. It's love in action. It is love that is acted upon. And, and so uh, if you care about somebody, if you have compassion about somebody, it, the idea is it should move you to do something. And, and properly, compassion does that. Compassion results in action to help the person upon whom you have compassion. And doing so is what can really make a difference in their life. Uh, go with me to 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3. One right after another. Three more places and we're done. First Peter 3, verse 8. 
1 Peter 3, verse number 8. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. That's God's people having compassion with each other. We ought not just have compassion upon the lost, though, though we certainly should, but we should have compassion one on another, one for another. Finally, be ye of all, all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are there unto call that ye should inherit a blessing. That's how God wants us to deal with each other. I'll read to this next one. I actually have to go back for this, but it's Hebrews 10, verse 34. And it says, for ye had compassion of me and my bonds. Paul ta talked to the folks. I was bound and you looked at me and you had compassion upon me and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. That is, he, they saw him, they were moved, they took of what they had and used it to minister to Paul in his bonds. The compassion moved them. The compassion is to be developed, is to be acted upon. First John chapter 3, God expects this. First John 3, and we'll be finished. Verse 17, 1 John 3, verse 17. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? There is a point in which you begin to experience compassion, where you then are either going to be moved by that compassion to act upon it, or quench the spirit and shut up those bowels of compassion. And if you shut up those bowels of compassion, John's telling us, well, well, really, then how dwells the love of God in that person? How dwells the love of God in you if you shut up your bowels of compassion and you don't do something to help them when you have that opportunity, when, when you have that means to help them? So we have some means to help some people. We may not have all the means to help all the people to the extent that we'd like to, but we have some means to help some people. And the first thing you've got is the gospel, if you have nothing else. And, and, and that's no small thing, because that's what can transform their souls from going to hell to going to heaven. And, and sometimes uh, other things that we can do, showing kindness, uh, can help water the seed of the word of God. And so I, as we think about these things, I want to tell you and challenge you, folks, look, go out this week and find somebody to have compassion upon. And, and, and watch them, maybe listen to them and, and, and be... Let that compassion develop and then be moved with compassion to do something uh, for their soul or something to minister to their needs and to try to reach them for good and for God. So, so find somebody, uh, try, to, try to do something because of that compassion and, and ask God to help you to make a difference in their life. Of some have compassion making a difference. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I am thankful, Lord, that you had compassion upon us. I'm thankful the Lord Jesus Christ had compassion upon the souls of men uh, to the point where he laid down his life uh, to, to, to the end that uh, he would take uh, our sin upon him. And I'm thankful, Lord, that uh, you have moved upon other people to have compassion upon us in our lives. I thank you for uh, Chuck Tyler. I pray, Lord, wherever he might be, that you'd bless him even tonight. Thank you for uh, Mike Todd, Lord, who was a pastor and and witness to me and, and then help me to grow uh, spiritually and, and uh, work with uh, me and, and, and teaching me and, and taking me under his wing and disciple me. I pray you'd bless him as he uh, ministers in the ministry with his wife, uh, Susan, Lord. Uh, help them, Lord, to continue to reach souls as I know that he still uh, is a witness and Lord sows the seed wherever he goes. Bless them tonight. Meet their physical needs, their health needs, uh, their spiritual needs. And I pray you would help us, Lord, tonight, Lord, to uh, get out of ourself this week sometime and uh, look upon somebody else with compassion. Begin to pray and, and then be moved to do and uh, help us to make a difference in their lives. I pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand tonight. We'll have the music play. And uh, tonight might be a good idea just during this uh, invitation time just to pray and ask God to give you somebody to have compassion upon this week.
And Father, I do pray, Lord, for each and every one of us that you would give us uh, somebody that you'd have us have compassion upon this week. Point that person out very particularly. And I pray you move us with compassion, Lord, in the fashion that our Lord Jesus Christ was moved. And may we not just uh, feel it, uh, may we do something about it and uh, help us to know in particular exactly what to do about it and help it to make a difference, Lord, in somebody's life for, for thee and their relationship with thee and for good. And uh, help us to do it. Help us not forget. Maybe we will forget about it. Remind us, Lord, uh, when the time comes and uh, help it to come to pass, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.